Welcome to the Recess Life Podcast. This is the place where we explore play and what it means to get back to your inner child. I'm Louise, your host. Join me as I chat with teachers, entrepreneurs, artists, and thought leaders about how we can live a life of more play and impact. Let's get it started. Hello, friends. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Recess Life Podcast. I am so excited about today's guest. His name is Dr. Peter Gray, and he is a research professor from Boston College. I first learned of Peter's work from his TEDx talk, The Decline of Play. In it, he talks about some interesting and harsh realities of what is happening with the decline of play in children. And he's also the author of a book called Free to Learn. In the book, he specifically criticizes the traditional schooling system and advocates for self-directed education or unschooling. So self-directed education is the idea that education is the child's responsibility and that unlimited, yes, unlimited play and exploration is a key component to that. Eek! That's a little scary, right? (laughs) Even though I am such a play advocate myself, the idea that education is the child's responsibility and unlimited play should be a part of that is slightly uncomfortable to me. So I knew I just had to have Dr. Peter Gray on to talk about this concept. And if you are a parent or you're thinking about having kids, you may find this episode interesting. I So if you are a parent or you're thinking about having kids, definitely listen to this episode. This episode's a little longer than usual, but that's because Peter had so much interesting wisdom to share. So I hope you'll stay tuned till the end. And at the end, I'll come back on to recap some of the golden nuggets from the conversation. So make sure you stick around for that. I'll catch you at the end. Peter, so glad to have you on the podcast today. Um, Like I told you, I recently read your book, Free to Learn. And I was so struck by the first story that you shared in the book about your son and how he insisted that he come out of the public school system. So um, can you share, just for those of the listeners who haven't read the book, um, can you share a little bit about that story about your son and how it started you on this path of sharing more about self-directed education? Yeah, well, I tell this story in the preface to my book, Free to Learn, um, how I got interested in this topic many, many years ago when my son was um, a child, uh, initially in public school. He um, went from fifth grade on um, through fourth grade in public school, um, and he, he hated every minute of it, and he let us know he hated every minute of, of it. Um, I don't think all children hate every minute of school or even at that age. Most children kind of like school. They begin to dislike school typically around middle school, but he disliked it right from kindergarten on. He felt it was he was very articulate even as a little kid that this was like prison to him, that he um, he felt he was being forced to be there. He felt it was wasting his time. He felt that he wasn't being respected as a person. Uh, And he was going to have nothing to do with that. But, you know, the law says he has to go to school. We, uh, at that point, this was many years ago, we didn't um, know of any other alternatives, really. We... I was an assistant professor, and at least at that time, still probably true today, assistant professors don't make much money. We couldn't really afford to put him in a private school, uh, and we didn't really have the the resources or the thoughts about homeschooling. So we fought with him. <laughs> we went into <laughs> teachers' conferences time after time. But eventually, there was this scene that I describe in the book, um, occurred in the principal's office. So this was a, this was to be a major confrontation in the principal's office, where 
the, the principal, the assistant principal, his classroom teacher, the school psychologist, some psychologist that was brought in from the outside, his mom, his dad. We were all there to tell him in no uncertain terms that he had to follow the rules of the school. He didn't have any choice about it. He had to be there. And he uh, just had to shape up and do what he was told to do in school. We all said our piece. And um, my little son looked at us all, stared us straight in the face, and said, go to hell. And um, wow. I, um, I started to cry. And uh, my wife, his mother, started to cry. And we looked at one another. And at that moment, we knew, we both could tell as we looked at one another, that he had won and that it was good that he won and that we had to be on his side and not against him. That he was right, at least for him, he was right. School was not a good place for him. And so, um, so it turns out there was a uh, school just a couple miles away from us. At that time in history, that was easy walking distance for a nine-year-old kid. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you didn't have to drive kids places in those days. And so uh, this school that was uh, that was a couple miles away was the Sudbury Valley School. And um, I was actually aware of it before, but we hadn't seriously considered it um, until this incident occurred. This is a school that is as radically different as you can imagine from um, from what we usually think of as school. It's uh, it's in a country setting. Uh, there's a big old farm building there and a remodeled barn and about 10 acres of land. It's very nice from all that perspective. And um, there are kids there from age four on through um, – on through what would typically be high school age, someplace else, on through the late teens. And um, they're not assigned to grades, so they can mingle by age freely. There's no, they don't segregate the kids by age. Uh, they don't segregate the kids into rooms. that Anybody can go any time of day to any part of the school or the campus that they want to. And there are no classes offered, but if you, uh, if a group of kids for one reason or another wants to have a class, they can get together and form one and usually talk a staff member into it. At that time, there were about 60 students and maybe five or six staff members. Now there's um, something like uh, 180 students and seven or eight staff members. Um, so this is a student. This is a school that's um, that's uh, that there are many many children. There's not a whole lot of adults, and uh, all the rules of the school are made by the school meeting, uh, which includes all the staff and the students. Uh, the school meeting meets once a week. Uh, the rules of the school, to the degree that they have to do with personal behavior, are enforced by a judicial system that's modeled after our judicial system in the larger culture. Um, and if your name is called to serve jury duty, you'd serve jury duty on this, just like in the larger culture. Uh, and But the jury is always formed of a mix of uh, ages. So there's always a couple of little kids, a couple of middle-sized kids, a couple of teenagers, and one staff member that's on what they call the judicial committee. It's con it's con uh, basically the same as what we call a jury, except that it lasts. If the judicial committee continues to meet over two or three weeks before it gets reformed to a new judicial committee. But that's the way the school operates. And um, so uh, my son, uh, not surprisingly, said this is what a school should be. <laughs> you know, he was very happy there. This is what he wanted. And it took him a little while to adjust. He was, by that time, he was, uh, he was a little awkward socially and so on. But he adjusted and was very happy there. And But I um, was... Um, I was concerned, you know, as probably any parent would be who uh, hadn't, um, you know, some parents somehow initially right away get it. I was not one who did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm a I'm a scientist. I kind of want evidence. Right. And so I was happy that he was happy. Um, but I was a little concerned. Um, I, I was a little concerned about his future. You know, what can you you graduate from such a school can you 
does this limit your life in some way? Do I remember thinking, do they all have to be artists or musicians? What right. else could they possibly learn on their own, right? <laughs> you know, Bake, bakers. What, what else would they be interested in, right? <laughs> These days, you'd probably add computer programming onto that. So the uh, so I got interested in. Um, I began to want to talk to some of the graduates of the school already at that time. So this was way back in um, the late 1970s that this was started. But already at that time, uh, I guess it was around 1980, there, uh, at that time there were already some, quite a few graduates of the school, some of whom had uh, done all of what would have been their K through 12 schooling there. Um, and so I did a study of the graduates along with the help of uh, somebody, David Chanoff is his name, who at that time was a part-time staff member there who helped me locate the former students. And um, there were about 90 graduates of the school, as we defined them at that time, people who left at typical high school graduation age, not to go to secondary school someplace else, but to go on to life and who had been there for at least two years, but some of them, as I said, had been there for their entire, um, K, what would have been K through 12 education. We located them, we managed to, we managed to um, get sort of an extensive survey uh, form back from the great majority of them, uh, and so I felt like this was a very valid study. I had, um, something like 90% response rate um, from from them. And um, the findings were absolutely turned my career. I mean, um, these young people, uh, mostly young, well, at that point they were young, uh, young adults, they were out there doing well in the world. <laughs> uh, none of them regretted having gone to such an unusual school. Those who wanted to go on to college uh, didn't seem to have any difficulty getting in. Imagine that. They'd never taken a course, some of them. Never, ever taken, never read a textbook. Never read a, never took a test until maybe they took the SAT test if they wanted to go to a fancy college, right? And yet they did it. You know, they got in. That's incredible. You know, these college, people think if you don't take all the right courses, you're lost. You'll never get into college. Or people think that, you know, you miss a few weeks of school, you'll be forever behind. Well, here are people who miss the whole darn thing, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> lo and behold, they weren't behind. They went on. And so that really got me interested. It really got me thinking, what, well, what is it that people learn? Uh, what is what? Do, what is actually is the meaning of education? How do people become educated? How, and um, and so I got interested in what's uh, actually happening at the school. And um, so some years later, uh, one of my graduate students uh, and I, uh, Jay, Jay Feldman was his name, um, did a extensive study. This was his. He did most of the actual work, and it was his doctoral dissertation. Spent hundreds of hours at the school making observations and um, and mostly, you know, observations of kids interacting in groups, sort of he became a fly on the wall, you know, they knew he was there to do research, but they kind of forgot about him. He, we had permission. He was, he was very young looking, so he kind of blended in. He could have been one of the older students himself. Uh, and, um, and based on that, we wrote an article about um, about the value of age mixing. So the kids are, um, as I say, they're free to interact with whomever they want. And there's enough kids that they could segregate by age if they wanted to, but they don't. They play across ages. The older kids are attracted to the little kids and little kids are attracted to the older kids. And, um, and so a lot of the interactions that occur naturally at the school, including the play, is age mixed, especially the play is age mixed. And, um, and we learn so much about how uh, younger children learn from older children when they are in that kind of an environment. They're constantly learning. For, every time that an older kid and then the younger kid are interacting, it's a learning experience for the younger kid. It's not explicitly so. The older kid doesn't think of himself or herself as teaching the younger kid. But just in their interaction, in order, in order for them to play a game, the, younger, the older kid has to boost the younger one up to a higher level of play. So, you know, if they're playing a game that involves numbers, the older one has to show the younger one how to add up the scores, right? Yeah. And while mm -hmm. he's teaching arithmetic, you know. Mm -hmm. If they're playing a game that involves words, and in modern times they're playing a lot of games on the computer that involves words on the screen. And if some of them can read and some of them can't read, the ones who can read are 
saying, hey, you know, this, see this word here? This is what, <laughs> I'm tired of reading this to you. This is, <laughs> remember what this word is. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I've even heard occasionally they'll kind of sound, give them a little phonics lesson. You know, it's there's a code here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if you know, so quick question about that. Yeah. yeah. If, if free age mixing happens so naturally in a Sudbury school environment, how come it doesn't happen as naturally in perhaps a conventional public school environment? Well, that's because we segregate children by age, and we make age a class. You know, you are a first grader versus a, a kindergartner, or a fifth grader versus a fourth grader. You're in a whole different social class, right? I mean, you know, you're and and moreover, and you're separated. You have very little chance to interact with one another. And when you do interact with one another, you're almost, by virtue of that ranking in school, you regard yourself as superior to that younger kid or the younger kid regards that older kid as kind of scary and superior to them. So, you know, the age graded schooling is in my mind one of the worst things we ever did to kids because children are really, I've become convinced from much more of my research that I've followed up, including research on how hunter get children and hunter gather cultures learn, research on children how children in unschooled cultures learn. Children are designed to learn from other children and they learn best from other children when they're age mixed. So we segregated children by age when we developed a kind of factory model of schooling. We developed this idea that schooling is sort of like a factory, you run the kids through an assembly line, so there's kindergarten is the first stop and then there's first grade is the second stop and so on and so forth. So you run them in batches like yeah. that. Process you know. them. And at, e at each age, you're adding a few new components to their knowledge, supposedly, and then they come out at the end of finished product. Well, that's the kind of model of education that led to age mixing. Of course, as schools got big, it became convenient. When you had one-room schoolhouses, you did have some age mixing that goes on. But as soon as we had large schools in cities, and then we had this model of, um, of uh, segregating children by age. It seems, you know, if you think about education as something that teachers do to children, uh, in this sort of way, it makes sense. You know, you would take a, you know, the idea is these kids would all be kind of at the same level. Of course, they're not really at the same level, but we can imagine that they're at the same level because they're the same age. And so they're all ready for the same lessons. And we give them the same lessons and so on. So, you know, when I was a kid, of course, we had age graded school back in the 1950s when I was in elementary school. But we, school wasn't the big deal it was today. So we had, and we didn't have all these adult directed things outside of school. So we had lots of time to play and explore. We spent more time playing outdoors with other kids when I was in elementary school. And it's not just me, this was most people, uh, than we spent in school. And that was age mixed, that was in the neighborhood. But now we segregate by kids by age even out of school, and we don't allow free play. We almost don't allow free play. We put them constantly in adult-directed activities. So, uh, so we've kind of destroyed the natural way that children learn from one another in age-mixed play. In addition to the free age mixing, what were the other components that you that the Sudbury School really, um, really upholds as their values in their education? Yeah, well, I've I've written about the uh, what are the conditions that maximize the opportunity for self-directed education, and 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 I'm not sure that the Sudbury Valley ever sat down that the people at Sudbury Valley ever sat down and said these are the list of conditions. But in my observations, these are the things that are really crucial. The first is the expectation that education is children's responsibility. That's the absolute, that the expectation, it's not adults' responsibility to educate children, it's children's responsibility to educate themselves. So that, you know, very few people in our culture are going to resonate to that idea. That mm -hmm. almost seems unfair to the children. They're just little children. Don't we adults have the responsibility right. to educate? And it's scary. Them? And it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. We're just, uh, we just trust them to, become ed to educate themselves. So, you know, the way I think of that part of it is it's our job as adults to provide the conditions in which they can educate themselves. We have to be sure that they're not growing up in a closet, right? They sure. Right, so the, um, so, but at, 
this becomes much more easy for me to accept based on partly on my studies of hunter-gatherer cultures and also based on a lot of psychological research that hasn't really been put together in this way so much before. But the, you know, ch everything we know about children is that they are biologically designed to educate themselves. They are so curious. They're born enormously curious. They are, as soon as their eyes can focus, they're looking around trying to make sense of the world around them. As soon as they can move at all, they're moving to get to things, to explore them. As soon, they, they learn language, of course, on their own. Their, nobody teaches children their native language. They learn it by hearing it and by babbling and interacting with people with it, but not because anybody's teaching it language to them. They learn, and once they've got language, they're using language to learn, to explore, asking questions and listening, over, listening in. They learn by watching and listening. This is how children have always learned throughout history. And what my studies show is these, these processes of learning work in our culture too, as long as we provide the conditions in which they can work. So that first, that acceptance of the idea that children are going to educate themselves, we don't have to do it if we provide the conditions that allow them to do it. The problem with our assuming the task of educating them is first of all, we don't do a very good job of it. And secondly, if we assume that task and we act as if all the kids have to do is do what we're telling them to do and they'll become educated, we can kind of quash their desire to educate themselves. And we do quash it in our schools. So, you know, when I, what are the drives for self-education? Their, their curiosity, their playfulness, which is how children practice skills, sociability, their they're wanting to talk with one another and share ideas and share knowledge and learn what other people know. Well, we completely shut those off in school. We shut them off because we, we basically we're telling the child, your questions don't count. It's the questions of the curriculum that counts. <laughs> yeah. And these are not even typically the questions of the teacher. The teacher is bored by these questions. But these are the questions of the curriculum. So curiosity no longer plays any role. Curiosity is a is a hindrance in school. Play we call recess instead of instead of part of learning. Play becomes a break instead of learning. Mm -hmm. And increasingly we're regarding that break as irrelevant as we take recess away in recent years, even right. from little children. We so, don't connect and, and, we don't connect play to learning. We see it as very separate in our culture. We, we see it as a separate thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then sociability, which I say is part of this whole thing, that becomes cheating in school. You help one another and that's cheating, right? You you know, you learn from one another by looking over at the paper that somebody else is doing or sharing your answers with somebody else. That's cheating. So we we fundamentally shut off in our schools children's natural ways. So that what we have to do if we want children to, to use their self-educative instincts is we have to not shut those things off. We have to provide an environment where children can use those instincts without being hampered by adults telling them that they can't. So that's the first characteristic of Sudbury Valley or of any good place for self-directed education. A second characteristic is that um, there be um, present um, a, a variety of adults who are caring, you know, who really care about the kids, uh, but who um, are not directive and non-judgmental. So it's important to have a variety of adults because um, because no one adult has all the characteristics that a child might need. And it's not just in terms of knowledge, it's in terms of sort of personality. You know, that kids are very good at assessing adults' personalities. And they, they can tell, you know, if, if you need a shoulder to cry on or a lap to sit on, you go to so-and-so. If you want a political argument, you might go, not go to that person, you go to this other person, you know. So a variety of adults, you know, that's why even when the school was small, it was important that they have at least five or six staff members, uh, adult staff members there. Now that it's much larger, they still don't need many more than that be because the kids don't so often go to the adults anyway. But it's important that they have the opportunity to when they need to and that they can make use of, of the adults. So that's a second characteristic. A third characteristic is that there be unlimited 
time to play and explore, that, there's, that they have uh, really unlimited time. Because if you're going to educate yourself, you need time to you need time to really pursue whatever your momentary interests are. You need time to try out different things. You need time you need time to get bored, you know, and to and to let boredom stir your soul until you figure out what you want to do. You need and and when you do discover something that's a passionate interest, you need time to pursue it. You can't. You can't follow a, per, per, uh, a passionate interest if every hour the bell is going to ring and you have to now go and do something else. Mm-hmm. So one of the things I discovered in the, my study of the graduates of Sudbury Valley and subsequently in other studies of, of uh, young people who are self-educated in this way is that many of them discovered real passions in their childhood play, which then became their careers, <laughs> Uh, as adults. So they were pursuing, you know, you talked about adult play. Their job was play because they were pursuing something, jobs that were really, really passionate interests of them and that they really enjoyed doing. So one of the things that happens in self-directed education is that many Many kids, not all kids, and some kids are, you know, they're, they, they do a lot of different things and they never develop what we would call a really extreme passion in one thing, and that's fine too. They figure out some way to make a living. But, but I would say about 50% of the kids in self-directed education that where I've studied them into adulthood find some real passionate interest, and then they figure out how to make a living doing that in adulthood. And they are really lucky people because they're pursuing their passions in adulthood. I could give many examples of that if you're interested, but people can find that in my writing as well. So yeah. second characteristic is lots of opportunity to play, explore, discover what you like to do, be able to pursue what you like to do. Um, another care, I guess I've, that's three characteristics. I've The fourth characteristic is, which I've already talked about is free age mixing. That's a real key to it. And it's not just that the younger kids are learning from the older kids. And it, you know, I talked about how they're learning in play by being drawn up to higher levels of activity. But they're also, even if they're not interacting with the older kids, they're learning from the older kids. They're overhearing them. They're acquiring a more sophisticated language. Maybe they're learning some dirty words too. That's the <laughs> probably that's that's the <laughs> downside of it, according to some adults. But you know, <laughs> they're also but they're uh, they're learning. They're they're acquiring a more sophisticated way of speaking. They're acquiring higher ideas by overhearing the other adults, and they're acquiring an understanding of of things that people do that they want to do. So. So to just give, I'll take the example of reading that, you know, that, so you've got maybe some four and five year olds and maybe even six year olds who can't read. And um, they're observing the, um, a group of seven, eight, nine year olds who are reading, maybe they're reading comic books and really laughing about it and having such a good time. And boy, they, these kids who can't read want to join that club. They want to get, they want to read seeing that adults are reading is not a big motivating factor for little kids. I mean, adults are in a whole different world. Adults do all kinds of things that if you're four or five or six, you can't really dream of doing, and nor do you particularly want to do it. The, the cool people that you want to be like are not the adults. They're the, they're the people who are just two or three or four years older than you. <laughs> right. And so you see them doing these things, and then you want to do them. And whether it's reading or whether it's tree climbing or fishing or, or, or whatever it is. And so that's a, that modeling experience, that's a big part of what happens. So that, But the older kids are benefiting just as much as the little kids because the older kids, when they're interacting with the little kids, are learning that they can be nurturers they can be leaders they can be helpers they can you know they can and this is an extremely important people person thing for people to learn even a six-year-old is the mature one in interacting with a four-year-old and the six-year-old one develops a sense of i'm not just a person who needs help i'm a person who can help i'm a person who i'm a person i'm capable uh, i'm capable and and also, when you are explaining something, whether it's the rules of the game or the rules of the school or anything else to a younger student, you are also consolidating that in your own mind in a more, in a deeper way than if you weren't explaining. Anybody who's taught knows that you learn more by teaching than you do by being taught. Because in teaching, you have to think it through in a way that you can articulate it. And so 
in this age mixed environment, the older kids are in a sense teaching the younger kids all the time as they're interacting with one another and they're consolidating their ideas as they do that. And finally, another, still another way that the younger kids are helping the older kids is, you know, in, in our society, by the time you're a teenager, you're, you, um, you know, the, you've kind of supposedly outgrown a lot of creative kinds of things. You know, teenagers don't generally play with clay or blocks or draw pictures or something, except for a few of them who decide they want to be artists or something. But most people don't do that anymore. It's just not cool anymore, right? But if there's a bunch of little kids around doing that kind of stuff, you are inclined to keep doing it. If only, you know, your excuse might be you're just playing with the little kids, but in reality, you're also doing something that you're enjoying doing. And just the presence of the energy and creativity of the little kids who are all naturally energetic and creative kind of helps the, the older, the teenagers who, especially those who've come to the school as teenagers and they're kind of burned out and cynical about the world, right? <laughs> they, it's hard to be cynical and burned out when there's a bunch of little kids around you who are so energetic and would like a piggyback ride, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so the little kids in many ways are helping the older kids just as the reverse is true. So age mixing is a, is a key factor to it. And then um, the, the f another factor that is um, crucial is the fact that you are in a caring community. You're not just, you're not growing up as an isolated individual or even as part of a nuclear family. You're growing up as part of a community. And if you're at Sudbury Valley, you're part of the Sudbury Valley community. So you have the sense that you, as you're growing up that you have a responsibility not just to yourself, but to the other people in your community. And, um, and I think that's really key, that's really crucial because um, we don't want people to grow up thinking that the only job is to take care of yourself, you know, that we are social beings, we, you know, we need to take care of one another, we need to be care in a, in a democracy, we need to be concerned about the democratic processes and so on. So I think that that's another, um, another key uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. one, one more thing that I missed is that there be present the tools of the society and that the kids can, what I say is play with them, which I really mean use them in creative ways and not just follow prescribed steps with them. So, so you know, Sudbury Valley has tools for cooking, it has tools for woodworking, it has sporting equipment, it has lots of books, it has, of course, computers. And, of course, the primary tool of our society today, hands down, is the computer. And so it's no surprise that kids uh, everywhere are attracted to computers and kids at Sudbury Valley, like every place else, uh, spend a lot of time on computers and get, get good at them. So that's, uh, that's a quick rundown on <laughs> what I see as the conditions that make mm -hmm. a place like Sudbury Valley work. Mm -hmm. And I really hear that there's a, a, th a thread of play through all of that. And why is play so conducive to learning? And why is that such an important part of self-directed education? Yeah. So, well, let me start off by explaining what I mean by play. Of course, play, sure. like like a lot of words, can mean different things, right? You can find even different de dictionary definitions of it, and we also use it differently in our regular language. So I want to be clear on what I mean by play. So I define play as an activity that has the following four components. The first component is that it's freely chosen and self-directed. So right off, it is self-directed activity, right? It's, it is, if somebody tells you to, if a teacher stands up in front of a classroom and says, now children, we're all going to play this, it's not play. Because if it's initiated by somebody who's not one of the players, and if it's initiated in such a way that you really can't refuse to do it, or it would be very re embarrassing or difficult to refuse to do it, it's not play. Play is something you want to do and you yourself choose to do. And it's something that where not only do you choose to do it, but you have a say in how it's done. You you make the rules or you accept the rules or you are in a position where you could have a voice in changing the rules as you go along. 
So, so play is, most children like to play with other children and throughout the world and throughout history, most play is social play. Children are playing with other children. So what they're doing when they're playing, the first thing they have to do is decide what it is they're going to play. We have to, you know, you and I are kids and you want to play that and I want to play this. And so then we have to, we have to figure, we have to compromise. We have to find something that we both want to play, right? Because I'm not going to play what you want to play and you're not going to play what I want to play. So we've got to find something that we both want to play that may not be either one of our first choice, but we we compromise. And then we start playing and, you know, maybe I'm a little bit of a bully. And so I try to tell you exactly how, what part you have to be. Maybe we're playing house and I tell you, you have to be the baby. And you're just sick and tired of being the baby. And you say, I'm not going to be the baby. So then we have to negotiate. We negotiate back and forth about how we play. So the fact that it's self-chosen and self-directed, think of all the learning that's going on there, the important learning. First of all, you're learning how to initiate an activity. Even if it's solo play, you're learning how you're learning how to take control of your life. You're learning how you don't need to always be told what to do. You can figure out something to do. You're learning what you like to do. You're, learn, you're acquiring your passions by choosing what you want to do. And you are learning how to um, make an activity work. You're learning how to create rules and modify rules. And when it's social play, you're learning how to negotiate. You're learning how to get along with, with your peers without some higher authority figure solving your problems for you. So that aspect of self-chosen and self-directed, you can just see all the really important learning. I mean, these... We well, you know one of the most important skills that any human being learns is how to know if their playmate, their peer, their person they're interacting with is having fun or not, right? And you know, if you can't do that, you really can't have a good marriage. You can't have you can't have real work partners. You can't have good friends if you can't do that. And children in play are practicing that all the time because they no, the you know the the biggest freedom in play is freedom to quit, and so if uh, if I'm not paying attention to you to whether you're enjoying this play, you're going to at some point just quit, and that is sort of the natural consequence to me for not paying any attention to you as we're playing, and so that's uh, that you know I, I'm just trying to give some ideas of what children are learning just from that aspect of play that it's self chosen self directed. Second aspect of play is that it's intrinsically motivating. It's intrinsic. You're not doing it for some prize. You're not doing it for a grade in school. You're not doing it for, for a gold star or a trophy. You're not doing it for praise from anybody. You're just doing it because you want to do it. And play is how children discover what they want to do. <laughs> How children find, that's how they discover their passions, as I talked about before. And in the lucky cases, they go on to make a living doing that. And um, a third characteristic of play, which surprises some people, is that play always is structured. As people talk about unstructured play. There's no such thing as unstructured play. All play is structured but it's structured by the players themselves. <laughs> so if it's structured by somebody else, then it's not play. But play, play is not random activity. You know, you're playing with blocks. You're not randomly piling up blocks. You're doing something deliberate. You've, hey, you've got something in your mind that you're trying to create with those blocks. You've got a set of constraints on how you're going to lay those blocks down. If you're playing, you know, you're playing house or you're playing superheroes, you know, the implicit rule is you have to be in character. If you're Wonder Woman, you have to act like you like Wonder Woman, like you, you, the way you and your playmates assume Wonder Woman would act. Your play is always um, an exercise in restraint. It's always an exercise in following rules. But children, isn't this interesting? The children eagerly put themselves freely and eagerly put themselves into a situation where they're no longer free. <laughs> they opt <laughs> in. They, they opt in. Mm -hmm. And the reason they opt in is because they can opt out whenever they want. So it's safe to be in this situation of following rules. But they love to do it. So they're, so so play is among other things it's where you learn to you learn to inhibit your whims and to follow the rules that you and your playmates have agreed upon. 
Mm-hmm. And what an important skill that is for all of social life, right? We all, as we go through life, you know, one of the differences between human beings and other animals is we can't just behave in accordance with our instincts and whims. We have to behave in accordance with socially understood norms and rules about what's appropriate and mm-hmm. what isn't appropriate at any, at any given time in our lives. And children are practicing that in play. You learn that through and play. Yeah. That you, you practice learn- it. You practice it. And then the fourth characteristic is play, although it has structure and rules, it always has lots of room for creativity and imagination. So play always is in some sense an imaginative activity. Children, no matter what they're playing, are putting themselves deliberately outside of the real world into a play world. And in this play world, it's a fantasy world. It's a make-believe world. And when you're in this make-believe world, you are engaged necessarily in what we regard as the highest order of human thinking, which is hypothetical reasoning. So I am, I am uh, Superman. <laughs> right? So this is a hypothesis. I'm not really Superman, but of course when I'm playing, I wouldn't say I'm not really Superman. I would just say I am Superman. But now I have to think about what are all the implications of that? How do I behave? What are the consequences of this? Or you're playing a game, there, you know, there's a troll under the bridge. We all agree there's a troll under the bridge. What does that mean in terms of how we behave around the bridge? Well, little children, three, four, or five-year-olds are thinking like scientists when they're, when they're thinking this way and having these discussions. This is all hypothetical reasoning. And, 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 um, so, and also the creativity that goes on in play and all kinds of play. You always have to think of what your next move is going to be, whether it's a whether it's a formal game like chess, you know, it's a cre- it's not it's not rigged exactly how you have to move. You have to f- you've you've got to behave creatively. You've got to think about how how you're going to move and so on. So all of play involves. So these are the things that are exercised in play. Think of that: how the social skills, the the intellectual skills of reasoning, the um, f- the rule following, the, the moral kinds of skills. Uh, you know, pleasing other people, uh, all of these things are learned. And and what I want to point out is none of these things can be taught in school or anywhere else that, by adults. They can only be learned from practice. And for children, the primary practice is play. The play is everything, <laughs> it really sounds like. One of the concerns I hear from parents who want to allow their kids self-directed play is that their kids will go to a device or an iPad, the, a laptop to play games for hours on end, and they aren't sure what the limit is that they should place on that child. What is the balance between adult interfering and giving limits to children as opposed to giving them free, unlimited play? Yeah. So here's here's my take on that. I know that this is a big concern in our society. People are worried that children are spending so much time on um, on screens, you know. Which uh, that uh, the uh, and here's the way I look at it. So at Sudbury Valley and in other settings where children can freely choose, in theory, all the children could be on their iPhone all day long, or they could be on the computer all day long. They could be playing computer games, they could be watching YouTube, they could be on the computer all day long. And uh, for some periods of time, some of the kids are, right? Some of the kids are. Uh, and, um, and I've learned, and people at such places have learned, not to worry about that. There are, people develop serious interests, and if, as long as it's their choice, they wouldn't be doing it if they weren't getting something out of it, and so the assumption is they're getting something out of it. But most kids, uh, and over the long run, they're not necessarily doing this all the time, but they're doing it maybe all the time for a period of time, and then they're doing something else. And But some kids really, you know, just like there are, all, there are some kids who you say all they're doing is fishing, <laughs> and then there's other kids who you say all they're doing is computers. We now have enough of a history with this to know that we don't have to worry about those people. As long as they're doing it freely, as long as they have an open menu, as long as they're not doing it because that's the only thing they're allowed to do, then uh, then they're, they're, they're getting something out of it. And the experience we've had, so... You know, one of the one of the first people who you could say spent all his time on computers at Sudbury Valley. This was long ago when computers were new. 
by his mid twenties, he was a multimillionaire. <laughs> you know, he went on and de- created a software company. He developed a real passion and interest. Uh, so he's doing okay, you know, and he's mm-hmm. happy. And he's uh, so. And and that kid who just fished, he went on to become a fishery biologist or or, a, or a, um, a, 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 an ecologist of some sort. I forget exactly what. So. So as I say, people develop passions, and as long as as long as um, they are doing it because they're really interested in it and they're really pursuing it, we can be sure that they're learning a lot in doing it, and they're and that we don't have to worry too much about. It. The thing that I am concerned about is I think a lot of kids are on computers more than even they want to be, and the reason is because this is sort of the only way we allow them to interact with other kids these days. Um, There was a wonderful book uh, that came out a few years ago by a woman um, named Dana Boyd. Um, uh, The main title of it was It's Complicated, but the subtitle had to do with something like teens on social media. And so she uh, interviewed teenagers across the country um, um, several hundred of them, if I remember correctly, about why they were on social media so much. And although, as the title says, it's complicated, the, the simple answer <laughs> that ran through everything else was this is the only way that they can get together with their friends without interference from adults. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, you know, when in the past, there are always places that teens could go to get together with their friends away. Uh, Teens need to do this. They need to get away from adults. But it's become almost impossible for them to do so. You go over to your friend's house and your mom is there. Her mom is there or somebody else there. You can't, you know, when, when I was a kid, there were hangout places outside the home that teens would go to when even when my son was a kid and uh, it was a teenager you know in the 1980s um there were you would find groups of kids in shopping malls you know just teens in shopping malls you don't find them there anymore they're not if their parents allow them to go the security guards don't allow them so so here isn't so what we've done we've put teenagers in a very tough situation we've we've more or less prevented them from getting together with other kids away from adults. And then we blame them for being on the computer. (laughs) And similarly, and this applies to younger kids too. So you can't, you know, when I was a kid, um, by the time I was five, I could take my bicycle anywhere in town, (laughs) all by myself or with my friends by five. (laughs) Now, you don't you don't find even 12 year olds out there alone on a bicycle or if you do it's very rare or with other kids without an adult you see kids on a bicycle nine times out of ten their dad or their mom is right there with them on a bicycle right you we don't we don't allow kids there there's a lot of research on this and i've documented a lot of some of this in my in some of my academic writing, but there's a lot of research on this. There's one study, this was actually done in the UK, but it's similar to work in the United States. What they did is they looked at three generations within the same families who had were living in the same place over those three generations. When they interviewed the grandparents in these three generations about how far they were allowed to roam when they were six to 10 years old, they could go five kilometers away on average from their home. When they interviewed the parents how far they could go, it was down to half a kilometer, right? (laughs) From five down to half. When they interviewed the parents about how far their kids could go, it was nowhere. (laughs) They were not allowed to leave the front yard on their own. This is what we've done to childhood. So we have taken away the opportunity for real outdoor adventure, which children need. And you can't really, I'm, I, I really would repeat this over and over, kids can't really have outdoor adventures if there are parents there, if there are adults there, because the adults run the show. The adults interfere. You can't really make your own decisions, no matter how wonderful a parent you have. You can't really be feel that you're free to make your own decisions if there are adults there overseeing you, whose job is to oversee you and protect you. Mm -hmm. You need to be out there away from adults, and we don't allow that. So how do kids get away from adults? They can escape uh, from adults by playing video games. 
except in those cases where the adults monitor what their video play, and then they still can't escape. But at least there's at least many kids can get away from adults, and they can so they can't have real adventures in the real world, but they can have virtual adventures in the virtual world. And if we were if we now deprive them of that <laughs> too, then we're depriving them of everything. So I think. I think we have in our society today among adults a kind of knee-jerk reaction that if we if we don't like what we see, then we ban one more thing <laughs> that our kids could do. Yeah. We need to be thinking the other way around. Instead of limiting our children's menus, we need to think about how are we going to expand our children's menus? How are we going to give them real choices in what they can do so that they have the options of doing the things that child, that that children have always needed needed to do before we start shutting down more of what they do. The other thing about video games and screens is all these scare messages that you read. Um, if you if you try to find the data, the actual scientific data behind them, it's largely not there. And I have um, I've written several blog posts based on analyses of the actual scientific data. And the evidence is that the screens are having far more positive benefits for children than negative consequences. Um, and but I'll I'll leave that. People can find on my Psychology Today blog um, various uh, essays that I've written where I I'm referring to review articles in the scientific literature on on um, on uh, all of these things, including the cognitive benefits of playing video games, including the evidence that playing violent video games does not cause real world violence. There's zero evidence that it does, <laughs> uh, including the fact that video play is not addictive in the sense that um, you read these scare headlines about how it releases dopamine in the brain, but the truth of the matter is anything that you do that's fun releases dopamine <laughs> in the brain. <laughs> and True. so mm -hmm. if, we were to, if we were to try to stop our kids from doing anything that releases dopamine in the brain, we would have to prevent them from doing anything that's fun. <laughs> so right, yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> so anyway, those are, you can, people can find, uh, find extensive discussions of that in reference to, to extensive review articles in, in yeah. psychology journals about that in my blog. Mm -hmm, yep, and I'll link to it in the show notes notes for your podcast. So okay. it's so interesting that you bring up in previous years or previous times, kids were allowed to venture out so much further than they are now. And I mean, I'm a, an adult and my parents still send me articles about kids getting kidnapped and saying, be careful when you're out there. And, you know, and, and it's just, right. it's just this interesting right. perception that our world is dangerous. And not to say that it isn't sometimes, but there seems to be more and more of a perception that it's dangerous outside and in our world that we need to be careful and kids need to be watched everywhere they go. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a perception and not a reality. The truth of the matter is that um, crime is down. Uh, crime was much higher in the 1970s than it is today. All kinds of crime, including any kinds of crime against children. And it's also the case that when children are snatched away, they are almost never snatched away by strangers on the street. <laughs> They're snatched away by, by the ex-spouse. They're snatched away by an uncle or relative who thinks the child is being abused at home. When children are molested, they're not molested by strangers on the street. They're molested by priests or by teachers or by <laughs> uncles or, you know, mm -hmm. these are, these are uh, you know, when you come down right to, when you really look at the evidence, it's just, is just very rare. Now, it is true, what I have to confess, is it is true that if you are the only kid out there, <laughs> you're in more danger than if there's a bunch of kids. So in some sense, you could say that it was safer when I was a kid because there are always lots of kids out there. And nobody's going to commit a crime in front of other witnesses, right? So nobody's going to come and snatch me away if I'm playing with a bunch of other kids and kids kind of protect one another. So I do think that there is more danger if you're the only kid out there. But it's not because it's really a more dangerous world now than it was before. It's not because there are, you know, somebody actually calculated based on the statistics, and I, I don't remember the actual amount, but it, somebody calculated, if you look at the actual data on kids being snatched away by strangers, you could put, you could put your kid 
on the worst street corner in New York City, the supposedly worst street corner in New York City, and wait, I don't remember what it was, like 5,000 years before somebody would snatch them away. People just don't want your kid as much as you think they do, right? They, you know, it's, <laughs> we have, this is really kind of an irrational fear. It's not irrational to be concerned. It's not, ir- it's not irrational to warn your kid. It's not irrational to say, hey, you know, don't, if somebody drives up and offers you candy, if they get, if you get in there the car, hey, don't go with them. And if they try to pull you in, start screaming, you know, but Mm -hmm. it's not irrational. And one of the things that we, that parents used to do, and when, even when I was a kid, and especially when I was a kid, is they would teach children common sense about safety. So instead of saying there's too much traffic, out there or you can't go out and play they would teach us how to deal with traffic how to cross streets how to look both ways how to wait at red lights and so on and so forth and they would they would uh, and so kids had the first day when you went to school the first day of in most places kindergarten this town I lived in didn't have kindergarten so it was first grade for me but the first day of school kids were expected to go to school on their own and you would get parents before school started we get a message to that they should they should walk the parent should walk the child to school once or twice before school ever starts and to show them the way and you should pin in case your child can't remember the address that you live at in case the child gets lost walking home you should pin on their clothing someplace their address so they can ask a stranger for help and directions getting home you know if they get lost Right, strangers are strangers were regarded as a good thing, and they still should be regarded as a good thing. <laughs> so <laughs> that's um, so. Th- but the point is that you know we would the, the expectation is it would really be kind of cruel to deprive children of the freedom to do these things, and so. But yet there is a little bit of danger, and so we have to help prepare our children so that if so that they're if they get lost, they'll know what to do, so they know how to find their way, so they know how to deal with traffic. And so they they know how to kind of distinguish between who might be a creepy person that you should stay away from and sure. who you might not stay away from. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you see as some of the consequences of our culture and society if play continues to be on the decline and if play continues to get taken away from our kids in schools and in their day to day life? Yeah, well, we're already seeing the consequences uh, because um, it has really been, as I, I have a, one of my academic articles is uh, called The Decline of Play and the Rise of Mental Disorders. And um, really, ever since the mid-1950s, we've been gradually taking children's play away from them. It's been a gradual change from one decade to the next, but over the course of six or seven decades, it has been a huge change. It's been a huge decline. And what's interesting is over these same decades, these same years that we've seen this huge decline in children's freedom to go out and play away from adults with other kids, we've seen equally huge increases in all sorts of mental disorders in children and young adults, huge increases. And it's not just that we're diagnosing things that we didn't diagnose before or defining these mental disorders differently. There are certain standardized questionnaires uh, that have been given to uh, high school kids and to young adults over the years unchanged. So, for example, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory has a scale that assesses depression in it. And there's a version of this that's been given to, uh, based to teenagers uh, since the 1940s. And ever since uh, about the mid, about 1960, with every, every time they give this, more people are depressed than there were before. And such that if you look at what would be on this scale, the cutoff point for suspected, what today would be called major depressive disorder, the rate of major depressive disorder, the estimated rate of major depressive disorder is now somewhere between five and 10 times what it was in the 1950s. And in fact, since there's been further decline, further increase in depression, even since those data were compiled, because those data ended around two, year 2000, and there's been increases in depression since then, there's probably even a bigger change than that. Similarly, there's a scale, another, another uh, 
uh, another clinical questionnaire that assesses sort of generalized anxiety. And what we call generalized anxiety disorder has likewise increased probably about tenfold based on, um, based on, on that test over, over the years. The suicide rate is, um, the suicide rate by, um, by two or three years ago, which is the most recent data I have, is six times uh, among school-age children, 15 and under, the suicide rate is now six times what it was in the 1950s. And this, again, has been a gradual increase. And it's not just that suicides have gone up for everybody. Suicides have gone down for older people. Um, they've stayed about the same for middle-aged adults. They've gone down for people my age. Uh, so the... Um, so, so suicides, so by every, by measure after measure, even more telling, per, not necessarily more telling, but on another, another dimension, um, believe it or not, there's a standardized way of assessing creativity that actually is a valid test, Torrance's test of creative thinking. And uh, there's a researcher uh, who a few years ago, analyze scores on this test. It turns out this test has been given to schools, school-age children of all ages for several decades now. And beginning in the mid-1980s, which was when we really began to change schooling and increase the, um, increase the, the focus on testing and take away a lot of the creativity, creative things in schools and take away recess and so on, and began giving a lot of homework to elementary kids. Ever since the mid-1980s, scores on this um, test of creativity have been going down at every grade level, going down substantially. So these are some of the measured changes that have already occurred. And um, although, although this represents a correlation, as play, goes, as play goes down, mental disorders goes up, creativity goes down, I, in my book and in my other writings, present all the reasons why I think this is a cause-effect relationship. I don't. I think it's no a no-brainer. You take play away from children, and the world becomes pretty depressing. <laughs> you you put children more or less always in situations where they're being judged and evaluated by adults, and they're in competitive situations rather than free play. That's a pretty stressful, anxiety-provoking world, right? Mm -hmm. You take away play, which is the most creative activity, and you take away the more creative activities in school for the sake of training for multiple-choice standardized tests, it should be no surprise that creativity goes down. So the kinds of things that our children really need for not only a happy life, but to be able to do well in our economy today are precisely the things that we are suppressing in children today. Our, our schools are doing exactly the wrong things in terms of what young people need and for their own happiness, but also what the economy needs. We, don't, we need people who are creative in the economy. We've got robots to do and computers to do the non-creative things. We need people who are creative. We need people who are socially competent. We need people who have moral values. We need, you know, these are things that children learn in play. They're not things that you learn in school. Mm -hmm. So on a practical level, you know, the truth is, is that a lot of parents, they have their kids in existing systems today, right? right. And for them, homeschooling, unschooling, Sudbury schools may not be an option or may not be compelling for them. So what are some ways they can implement self-directed education in a way that's very practical? Um, or what are some right. ways that these ideas can be integrated into their existing schools when also existing schools have very low budgets and they're, some of them right. are already struggling with money as it is? Um, any thoughts on how this can be applied on a, in existing right. systems today? Right. Yeah, I, I actually give quite a few talks to uh, public school people to, you know, oftentimes organized by the superintendent of schools and so on. And my first piece of advice, not always taken, <laughs> is instead of constantly increasing the amount of time in school, increasing the amount of homework, increasing standardized testing, let's go in the other direction. <laughs> Let's decrease the amount of time in school. Let's decrease homework. So kids have time away from school. So that's the first thing that has to happen. Kids have to not be constantly busy. Let's also, you know, educators, teachers, superintendents of school could become educators to parents who could explain to parents that kids also need play. 
so, you know, we need to figure out ways for in our modern society that kids can get out and play with other kids. One of the school districts that has gone farthest in, uh, in the direction that I would like to see schools go is a, is a Patchogue Medford School District on Long Island, New York. Um, the superintendent, he's, he's recently um, been snatched away by another school district. Uh, but he's become somewhat famous, a bigger school district. So, and so he's just started this other school, but this other school district. But he was the principal at uh, Patchogue Medford. He had seven elementary schools in his district. He had read my book, Free to Learn, and he had um, contacted me, and he also became aware of the, of the nonprofit Let Grow, that Lenore Skenazy, who wrote the book Free, Lane, Free Range Kids, and I and a couple of other people have formed. And at Let Grow, we actually work with schools, and we work with whole communities to try to find ways to bring more play into children's lives who are going to regular school and who are living in typical communities. So here's some of the things that have happened at Patchogue Medford, uh, which, uh, which um, you can actually find, uh, he's done a TEDx talk, you can find information if somebody, if you just, if you Google Michael Hines is the name of the superintendent, you can find some of, some of this online. But one of, the things, one of the things I would like all schools to do is to open up after school for free play. <laughs> so that whole period of time between the time when school ends at three o'clock and parents get home at five or six o'clock, that could be free play at school. Age mixed, all the kids together. They could be, you could use the outdoor playground if there is one, the gymnasium, if it's got a swimming pool, which some schools have, you could use that too. You could use the art room, the computer room, all open for free play. Uh, wouldn't that be great? I mean, that would be, you know, that could add 15 hours a week of free play. You're beginning to approach, you know, it's still not as much as kids need, in my opinion, but at least it comes a whole lot closer than kids are getting today. So that, and, and that would be, you would, that would be a win-win because the parent, it solves the babysitting problem for the parents it, and, mm -hmm. um, and so on. So, well, no school has done that so far, but, um, Michael Hines would like to be able to do that. It turns out there's all kinds of bureaucratic difficulties of doing it. Turns out to, as you said, there's budgetary problems. It turns out to be more expensive than it should be. Uh, there are teachers union rules and so on that make it more expensive. You have to hire real teachers. You can't just hire, you can't do as one would have done in the past, just hire a couple of parents and teenagers to oversee it. So you've got to pay teachers salaries for this and you have to have by law a certain number of adults per kid, you know, per number of kids. So there's all kinds of bureaucratic stumbling blocks. But the uh, but nevertheless, um, Michael Hines wanted to do what he could. So he started off um, at a much less ambitious than I had hoped, but with one hour of free play, all classes together, using the whole, basically the whole school, but before school rather than after school. For some reason, it's easier to do it before school. They already had kids who had to come an hour early. They already had teachers who had to be there to kind of monitor the kids there. So I was concerned that this wouldn't work because the kids aren't going to want to get up an hour early for school, even if it's for play at school. But it turns out that they've instituted this and the kids do want to get up an hour earlier. They're, they're insisting that their moms wake them up and get them to school in time for, for what they call a play club. In school, anything that's not a class is a club, right? So it's a play club. So, and the teachers are, I was also concerned that the teachers would not be able to refrain from intervening and teaching and helping the kids and that would defeat the purpose. So one of the things I suggested is that the teachers imagine that they are like lifeguards on a beach. Their job is to save a life if somebody's life is truly in danger, mm -hmm. but not to intervene about little quarrels, not to worry about scraped knees, not to, not if they see somebody who looks a little lost, a little unhappy, it's not their job to go over and make them happy. This is time for the kids to figure things out themselves and to work with one another to solve their own problems. Well, to my uh, amazement, in a way, they are really following that, and it's working. Um, the, the Lenore Skenazy has been visiting several times, and I was visiting um, because uh, uh, 
the, the uh, public television news hour program did a segment on it and had me down there to talk about what was going on. And that was really the only time that I observed a whole session of it. But it really is remarkable. There would be 150 or more kids, uh, age five through 11, whatever fifth grade would be, uh, all playing together. Um, some of them roughhousing. They're running in the hallways. Nobody's telling them they can't run in the hallways. <laughs> they're tossing balls. They're tossing things down from a balcony. They're really having fun. They're not destroying anything. They're not hurting one another. They're just plain having fun. And uh, everybody seems to be enjoying it. The teachers are enjoying watching them, and they're not intervening. The principals of the school say that the teachers are developing a better attitude about the kids because they can see how, how bright the kids are when they're in this kind of environment. So, you know, the same kid who might, they might have thought seemed kind of stupid in the classroom, they now see this kid is really pretty brilliant out there. And I should, you know, and the kids are going on to school happier. They're feeling better about what they're doing in the classroom as a result of this. So it, that's really successful. But in addition, what Michael Hines has done is he's encouraged the opt-out movement for testing so parents can opt out of standardized testing. And I think, I might be wrong on this, but I think that the latest data I heard is that 50% of the kids are not doing standardized testing because their parents have chosen opt-out there. Uh, he's uh, decreased, if not cut out entirely, homework in elementary school. Um, He's instituted a few, few other things like, you know, sort of starting some of the classes with meditation or sort of talking, you know, things mm. that are aimed at kind of creating a relaxed and happy environment. And so um, Michael Hines has become a bit famous for this. And, um, you know, and I think that other schools now, you know, the parents at Patchogue Mayford are raving about this on their Facebook pages. Other schools are asking for it at Let Grow. We're hearing from other schools who would like us to work with them to develop some, some of these similar programs. So, That's this, is so something, exciting. this is something that can be done uh, in standard schools. And I think that if parents become aware of this and they start pointing, they start, you know, letting their, the superintendent and principals of their schools know, hey, take a look at what Patchogue Medford is doing and can't we move in that direction a little bit? Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. think that's something that could um, could really reform our schools uh, and and make schooling a much happier place. I think schools districts are becoming concerned about this, and one of the things that that they're becoming concerned. So schools pride themselves in in how you know how many how many of their graduates get into elite colleges. But many of those same schools that get the most students into elite colleges also have the highest rates of suicide, and that's not something that they're proud of. Mm -hmm. And they're beginning to realize that, uh, wait a minute, we've got to think through what we're doing here. <laughs> yeah, we've got to we've got to somehow figure out how to take the pressure off. And sometimes it's the very kids who get into Harvard. Harvard's had a fair number of this been an issue there, a fair number of suicides that have been prominent in recent times. So. If parents begin to think and schools begin to think, hey, wait a minute, you know, what's the point of what's the point of getting our kids into elite schools if they are unhappy? Isn't happiness way more important than that? Yeah, this is happening <laughs> at, at what cost? At what cost? And and the other thing, the truth of the matter is that, and this is another blog post if people want to find it. There's actually scientific data, well-controlled studies that indicate that other things being equal, going to an elite college doesn't give you a boost. No. <laughs> um, you are, if other things being equal, come from the same social class, you know, same, you know, same kind of motivations and so on. The one who goes to 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 an Ivy League school or to Stanford. Um, in the long run, isn't doing any better, even by conventional measures like income earned by age 40, mm -hmm. uh, than the one from that same background who went to a local state college. So there's, so all this, all this frenzy we have about getting our kids into the most elite preschools, so they can then go to the most elite, you know, <laughs> private schools and the most elite prep schools, so that they could make it into an elite college mm -hmm. or the parents in this scandal who were who are cheating and lying to get their kids into the all of this is just wasted effort it's so counterproductive it's not doing yeah. your kids any favor at all mm -hmm. <laughs> and and similarly if you you're not more happier if you make more money either 
you know, that's out. That's the other side of it. Of course not. And you know, you want to make a living. You're not happy if you're, if you're poor, if you're really poor, but you want to make a living and you don't want to be a burden on the state, right? You don't want to, but, um, but beyond that, the most important thing is you'd be doing something that you enjoy doing. There's no point in, there are a lot of unhappy doctors and lawyers and business uh, executives out there, and there are a lot of happy plumbers <laughs> and, yeah. uh, who are making a darn good living, too, at least if they're charging what they charge me when they mm. come and, you know. <laughs> Right. So, you know, the... Um, I think we really have to examine our priorities. <laughs> we do. This is part of a ongoing conversation that needs to be had. And I so appreciate you for for bringing such a voice to this conversation, Peter, because I know it's not an easy one to have. And I know you probably have a lot of people that push back on you. So I really appreciate you um, taking a stand on this. I have a few rapid fire questions that are just fun that I try to end with my guests. Sure. Um, okay. Okay. So what did you want to be when you grew up when you were a child? Oh, wow. You know, I, there's not one thing. So unlike these, these people that I talk about who developed a particular passion, there's not one thing. Uh, but what I can say is, you know, I became a scientist. And what I can say is that as a child, I was drawn to data. <laughs> you know, I used to I used to do these really weird things. Like when I was ten years old, we lived near a um, a railroad track, and I would go out every time the train came by. I would go out and make a note on what time of day it was and how many cars there were on the train, and I would put it into my book and I would calculate the average number. Why I did that, <laughs> but I just like numbers and columns of numbers, and I still do. I'm motivated by data. So I think, I think there was some early prediction that I was going to be a, a scientist of some sort, at least, who dealt with statistics and data, and uh, I went on, on that direction. If you really wanted to know what I said I wanted to be, I wanted to be a major league baseball player. I wanted to <laughs> yeah. But so did so did all my friends, and at some point I realized, okay, I'm never going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with science instead. <laughs> I'll have to settle for second best. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. If if you could have any superpower in the world, what would it be? You know, the problem with the problem with superpowers is that um, they give you some kind of responsibility to go <laughs> with the superpower. So I'm I'm not actually sure that I would really want to have a superpower. But I guess if I had a superpower, I would, I would want the superpower of somehow, somehow being able to like um, cast a net of common sense. <laughs> that, you know, like spidey, a spidey net I'd cast out over the world and somehow... <laughs> people would begin to think in common sense instead of, you know, kind of, uh, you know, we, we operate under so many myths and so many illusions and so many, um, we, we, uh, we, we hear something and we think it's true without looking, without kind of asking the common sense questions about it. And so if somehow I could promote common sense in the world, I guess, um, that's at least what comes to mind when you ask. Common that sense. <laughs> I love it. All right. And what are one to three truths you have to impart on adults on living a creative, playful life? Um, I'm at the age where I'm starting to see cynicism creeping in around my friends and seeing them feel like they need to sort of let their playful spirit die and be be left in their childhood. And so what would yeah. you impart on adults that are, that feel this way? Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good question. I, I think that, so one, one thing I would impart, so I'm, I'm 75 years old. And so one thing I would say is life keeps getting happier. Don't think life is, don't think things are downhill as you get older <laughs> life. As long as you can keep 
try to do whatever you can to keep healthy. Keep, don't say when you're 40 that I, I'm too old to do this or that, or when you're 50 or when you're 60 or when you're 70. I hear that don't every day that. from my friends that are in their yeah. 30s. Keep, I'm too old keep, for this. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So that, yeah, people, you know, I go out kayaking. I go out bicycling every day. I swim in the river behind my house. I uh, go cross country skiing in the woods. I keep doing the, keep doing the things. If what it's when you stop doing the things that you enjoy and that are good for you and make you healthy, that's when you start to get old. That's when you start to decline physically. So that's one thing I would say. Another thing I would say is, is be a certain amount of humility helps in life. <laughs> in a sense, humility is part of the playful spirit. You know, one of the things about play is that it doesn't really count. And there's a, you know, because it's all in this fantasy world. So we try to do our best. We try to, we try to do good things in the world. But in the end, in the end, we die. <laughs> we go away. <laughs> it didn't matter too much. And I, and, and that might sound to some like a depressing idea, but think of it not as a depressing idea. It means that this thing that seems so important to you right now that you're all anxious about it or you're feeling despair about it it's not all that important (laughs) (laughs) it's really not all that in the grand scheme of things (laughs) in the grand scheme of things it's not all that important and and that's part of kind of having a playful approach to life and um and then and then the other thing i think in terms of adult play I think the way to think about adult play, I think about adult play differently than I do children's play. I define children's play in a certain way. With adults, I don't so often use the word play as the word playfulness. Mm. So if you can bring a playful spirit to whatever you're doing, you're, you, are, you are having more fun doing that. A playful spirit to your being a parent, a playful spirit to your job. You know, how, can you, how can you take this job and make it more playful. How, you know, by virtue of bringing these elements that I said are part of play to it, how can you make it more, more social, more fun, less, um, more self-directed? You know, the, the, in any kind of job, there's, there's a range of what, to the degree that you can be self-directed in it. Um, and if you kind of take control of what you're doing, then it becomes more, more playful. I'm making my more of my own decisions and your employer might be very happy that you're making more of your own decisions as long as you're not wrecking the company <laughs> but yes. the uh, you know <laughs> there are people there are people even i read of somebody who was just this was years and years ago was just working on an assembly line job the most the most boring tedious job you could imagine and and uh, somebody asked him well how is it that you seem to have such fun on this job and he said well i make a game out of it i i try different ways of doing the assembly i time myself how many how much how how quickly can i do this can i beat my record i'm sort of like i'm a olympic <laughs> i'm an olympic star in my imagination at putting this piece together so this is a person who's taken a playful approach to what would seem to me the most unplayful job you could have so if you can do it with that you can probably do it with just about anything um, so those are some of the things those are the things i would suggest mm. to I love that. Yeah, when when I think back on my life so far, the only things I've really been able to be um, excellent at are the things that I've allowed myself to be self-directed in. Um, yeah. And whether that's my, even the way I would approach doing a project on in work, I, I'm an event producer. And if I take a self-directed approach to the project, I end up doing such a better job i enjoy it so much more i connect with the clients so much more and every every, anything else in my life has been i've I've only excelled at it if i allowed myself to be self-directed in it and that's completely up to me that's not that doesn't have anything to do with anyone around me so it's a it's a mentality so right yeah that's that's the idea that's the idea yeah oh so great we have gone over the time but we were just such on a roll i hope that's okay and i so appreciate this conversation. That was Dr. Peter Gray. I hope I'm as cool as him when I'm 75 years old. I really enjoyed our conversation and it was chock full of information, but I pulled out a few things that really struck me. Number one, 
self-directed education is the way that kids learn best. And we need to provide the conditions for those kids to really learn in that way. And a key component of that is play and exploration. And not only that, but unlimited time to play and explore. Dr. Peter Gray says that kids can't really discover who they are, discover what they really like. And if we keep ringing the bell every hour at school, right? If we keep interrupting them with something that they have to do. And, you know, that kind of makes sense. The ways I've had epiphanies on my own is when I've had that time and space to really explore and figure out the answer on my own. And it's really comforting to hear that this is how kids learn also. Number two, I found it super interesting that Dr. Peter Gray doesn't demonize screens and devices like some parents do when they talk about their kids going on them all the time. And this is a concern I hear from a lot of people who have kids that say, you know, when I let my kids do what they want, they just scroll through my phone all day or they'll play on the iPad and I can't get them to stop and I can't let my kids play. So when I asked Dr. Peter Gray about this, he chose to look at it a different way. Screens and devices these days are sometimes the only way we let kids interact with other people, or it's the only thing we let them do because we're so scared of them going out and playing with their friends, playing out in the streets and playing out in public. So they really have no option but to play on a device. So I think that's a super interesting way to think about it. If we were to give kids more options, would they be interested in doing other play-based activities that weren't just looking at screens? If we allowed them to play more freely out in neighborhoods or in open spaces, would they still be interested in looking at a screen? I didn't have um, a cell phone or iPads or devices to look at when I was growing up, but I would jump on the trampoline at my friend's house. Um, I would play video games a little bit, but that was usually a short portion of what I would do. I would ride my bike, I would go to the park. I feel even if I would have had a cell phone or an iPad to play with when I was growing up, I wouldn't have solely focused my time on that. I would have continued to jump on trampolines ride my bike, do all the activities I did because those were fun and I would get bored on a screen after a while. So I would like to think that if you give kids more options to play, they're going to choose the activity that's most compelling to them. And the more options you give them, the higher likelihood that they'll find the most interesting and fun activity for them. Number three. If we continue to take away play in the lives of children, there's going to be big consequences for our society and for humanity, really. So Dr. Peter Gray cited a number of studies that have been done since the 1950s around mental health, depression, and anxiety in kids as play has gone down. And it makes sense because play brings joy into children's lives. It gives children a sense of control of their lives. And when you take away the activity that gives them a sense of control in their life, of course, they're going to have more anxiety. So I think we really need to think about what we're doing when we take away play from our kids. Because if we take away play, what are the consequences of that? At what cost are we taking away play? Maybe they'll get into an Ivy League school, but is it worth it if their anxiety levels go up or if they're miserable every day? Something to think about. So maybe it's time to look at play differently in the lives of our kids and for ourselves as adults. Let's be good examples of what it means to be playful for the rest of our lives. Thank you again for tuning into that conversation with Dr. Peter Gray. I really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. And especially if you're a parent, I hope it gave you some thoughts about how you may want to raise your children and how you think about play for your kids. If you are interested in learning more about Peter's work, I will link his TEDx talk and his blog on psychology today on the show notes. I also highly recommend that you read his book, Free to Learn, where he delves into the topic of self-directed education much more deeply. 
Are you looking for more play in your life? Make sure you're subscribed to the Recess Life podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or any of the podcast platforms. You can also find the video interviews on YouTube. Don't forget to leave a review. Your feedback is so important to me and it helps others to find the podcast. You can also follow the conversation on Instagram at The Recess Life. And lastly, you can go to TheRecessLife.com where you'll find all the episodes and show notes on each of our guests. I hope this podcast helps you to become a little more playful today than you were yesterday. Until next time, don't forget to get out and play today.